mushrooms. An issue we haven't heard much about so far in this long election campaign is mental health. Maybe we will over the coming six weeks between now and election day, but so far not much. Bill Shorten, in fairness, has said on mental health that he would commit to 12 trial sites to assist mental health services, uh, help those services, help people in crisis. Uh, but certainly uh, no new funding commitments from either side. Today, Mental Health Australia has called on both parties to focus more on this issue and put forward a range of priorities they want to see both Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten focus on, and then they say they will issue a report card before we get to the election date itself. Frank Quinlan is the CEO of Mental Health Australia and joins me now. Uh, Frank Quinlan, thank you very much for joining us. So, just looking at the priorities Thanks, that you've listed today, uh, the first one is reducing the national suicide rate. You've then got others, including the physical health and well-being of people with a mental illness. And uh, you, you finally say maintaining the current overall levels of funding, but it doesn't seem you're actually calling for more money. I'm sure you'd like more money spent on mental health, but that doesn't seem to be your priority right now. Is that right? Look, what we're asking for from the major parties today is for a longer term commitment. So we often see this sort of bidding war at election time where we get an injection of some money here or a ribbon cut to open a program there. And what we're asking the parties to do is to really to commit to something bigger than that. We're saying we need to define what a successful mental health system could do and could achieve. And we need to set some targets around what it could do and achieve. And once we know what those targets are, and once we've agreed that that's the way we're heading forward, then we can work out how the money should, should be attached to that. Well, this and we is think a, that that yeah. gives us a much long, a, a longer term prospect of achieving the sort of reforms that we're after. The idea of targets is a really interesting one. And I suppose uh, when it comes to Indigenous health, we have the close the gap targets that have been placed for years now and we can measure every year how well or how poorly we're doing in, in trying to close the gap. Are you talking about a similar approach here when it comes to uh, mental health in, in setting targets that we can measure each year how we're going? That's right, we are. Our, the organisations that uh, Mental Health Australia represent spend an enormous amount of time collecting information and reporting it to governments. Uh, information that's never collated and reported and mostly relates to activities. And what we're saying is across three main areas, across the suicide rate, across the physical health gap that's experienced by people with mental illness, and across employment, if we could set some clear targets that said, let's reduce the suicide rate, let's close the um, early death rate on mental illness. Uh, people with mental illness can die up to 20 years earlier than the rest of the population. And let's ensure that people who are experiencing mental illness and their carers uh, are in employment or in other forms of social participation. We think if we could set clear goals across each of those areas, there would flow from that lots of investment into the sector, but importantly, uh, a long-term program to actually achieve those targets once they're reported, once they're reported regularly. These are three really important areas. Uh, I want to put you on the spot here, but what are the current statistics that we are looking at? You mentioned there the 20-year life expectancy gap uh, when it comes to those with a mental illness, but what about the suicide rate? And the other one you mentioned, the employment gap as well. What are some statistics sure. that we can actually point to? Yeah, sure. As, as you said, um, we know that the physical health gap, we know that people who experience mental illness can die 20 years earlier. That's because their smoking rates are high and because cardiovascular disease often goes untreated or diabetes goes untreated. So there are some very concrete things we can do to reduce that. Uh, I think many of your viewers would be surprised to know that the suicide rate in Australia is probably trending upwards rather than downwards. On the best information that we have, which is 2014 numbers, something in the order of 2,800 people died by suicide in that year, which to put that in perspective is seven or eight people dying every day by suicide. We think that's an urgent crisis and we think in the long term we could cut that rate in half. We know we've done it with um, road accidents, we know we've had enormous impact on smoking. We see no reason why with a concerted effort over time uh, we couldn't be reducing that suicide rate. And then in employment there, there uh, is uh, enormous underrepresentation of people who experience mental illness in the uh, workforce. We know that people are still loathe to talk about mental illness with their employer because they're likely to experience uh, discrimination. 
And we think if there was one place you could start with that employment prospect, it would be to actually employ people with mental illness directly uh, as peer workers in the mental health system. We know we have uh, workforce shortages. We know that the evidence is clear that people with a lived experience of mental illness can be very effective in helping others to navigate the system. And so a program that saw people employed as peer workers would be a great place to start on the employment front. Uh, so just explain to me a bit further on that peer worker idea. You're talking about someone to assist in the workplace, uh, those with a mental illness. That's, that's right. So. Uh, people with a lived experience, uh, perhaps who've come out the other end or are part of, on their recovery journey, uh, have invaluable experience. And the evidence from overseas suggests that, for instance, putting a peer worker in with police force, uh, first responders who, are, who might be going out into the community to uh, see people in mental health crisis, uh, placing a peer worker in that team can result in lower arrest rates and lower violence rates. Similarly, in accident emergency units, we know that uh, people are often very distressed uh, when they're mentally ill and coming into a hospital environment. We know that the impact peer workers can have in that environment is to reduce violence and to reduce admission rates. And we know that across the system, in programs like the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, the invaluable experience of peer workers uh, could go a long way towards assisting people to navigate that system. Now, you, you talk about a concerted long-term uh, effort can tackle some of these issues on the suicide rate, on the employment gap, on physical health as well. What does that concerted long-term effort look like? We saw only recently, at the end of last year, the government announced its reforms uh, to, to the mental health um, space after the, uh, the Mental Health Commission uh, did its work in 2014, I think it was. We saw those reforms at the end of last year. I think there was a new hotline set up, a new website, some redirection of funding to get into more early intervention. Are you saying th this isn't the right approach? What, what sort of uh, reform are you, are you talking about? We're really talking about getting onto a much longer term horizon. So. Uh, all of those reforms that you mentioned are welcome. All of those responses are, are welcome. But as I said in my introductory comments, we often see us lurching from uh, one new investment to another, one new approach to another. And over the last five years or so, the organisations that are delivering services in the mental health space have often uh, had very short-term contracts, 12 months, six months. Uh, some organisations don't even know what services they'll be providing on July the 1st because of the changes that are afoot. And what we're suggesting is that by setting some long-term uh, objectives and by having all of the major parties commit to those objectives and report them publicly over time, we can get out of this sort of short-term cycle where organisations are often changing direction quickly, uncertain where they're going. Our, our organisations are very ready and eager to embrace reform and the system has to be different. And that's one of the reasons why I think we've failed to attract investment is because the system has been uh, so fragmented and difficult to navigate. And how we think that by setting up, I was going to say, how important is bipartisanship here? Because this shouldn't really be an issue of, of, of politics, should it? And it, it, when you talk about certainty, when it comes to government changing hands every uh, every election or every couple of elections, bipartisanship would seem to be pretty important here. Bipartisanship is very important and support of the minor parties as well is very important because uh, it's that change of direction, the constant change in direction uh, that leaves uh, A, organisations not knowing where they're going, but more importantly, it creates tremendous uncertainty for the individuals who live with mental illness every day, their carers, who are find it increasingly difficult to navigate a system that is uh, changing and, and chopping and changing and being redirected. So we're saying let's establish a 10-year horizon, for instance, on the suicide goal. We think we should set a 10-year goal to reduce the suicide rate by half. And in doing so, we think we could achieve a lot of very substantial reform across the system. And let me ask you, uh, finally, Frank Winland, you'll, you'll be putting out a report card uh, before the election. Right. Uh, we'll see whether they do embrace your idea that you've put forward here of targets, a 10-year goal in particular to halve the suicide rate, but beyond that, uh, if, if they don't commit to these targets, you, you'd be looking at what, uh, what reforms they put forward, what specifically are you going to report on in this report card? 
Sure, we'll be reporting on the commitments that we've asked for in this uh, letter that we've written to the leaders uh, just this week. So those three targets and indicators that we talked about. We're also asking for a much greater commitment to involve uh, people with a lived experience of mental illness in the planning, delivery and evaluation of services. And we're also asking uh, for guarantees around protecting the funding envelope. Again, I think many of your viewers would be surprised to learn that uh, we will spend less on mental health uh, in the next financial year than we have spent in the previous financial year unless we see uh, new commitments. So we're asking uh, the leaders of all those parties uh, to commit to protecting that funding envelope. We'll simply report the facts. Uh, people's voting patterns are uh, very complex, but we do know that whenever we ask uh, the broad population, uh, mental health issues and mental health concerns are very high on their agenda. We know that mental health affects one in five Australians each year and nearly half of all Australians over the course of a lifetime. So this is very close to people's hearts uh, and I think that people uh, will see it as one of the important priorities uh, when they choose who they're going to vote for in the 2016 election. Yeah, I'd be surprised if anyone watching hasn't either been personally uh, touched or knows someone who has been by mental illness. Uh, Frank Quinlan, the Head of Mental Health Australia, thank you for joining us. Look forward to checking in with you throughout the campaign. We'll, um, Keep the pressure on, see how both sides go on uh, your ideas you put forward today. Thank you. Thanks for your interest, David. Now, uh, also, support uh, from these organisations is available for anyone who may be feeling distressed. You can call the same helpline on 1800 18 72 63, Lifeline on 131 114, or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 4636. So the idea there of uh, a 10-year goal to halve the suicide rate along with targets for uh, closing the, um, the life expectancy gap or at least reducing the life expectancy 